Okay, I think we can start uh, okay. the session. Uh, what looks like a very interesting uh, and uh, competent group of people who have so much knowledge about the delivery of eye care in our country, uh, bringing in different points of view. And uh, together, I think uh, there will be a complete uh, prescription for how we can deliver eye care in our country as we go into the future. Some of you perhaps will share also the experiences during this last two difficult years. And uh, that might certainly help. Mm -hmm. So the very first uh, talk I am supposed to be giving, and uh, that's on our model of uh, eye care, the pyramidal model of eye care delivery. And uh, do you see my slides? Uh, no. Not yet. Yes, not, not yet. Not yet. No? No? No. There seems to be some difficulty. I don't know why. I am seeing it. AV, uh, yes. can we... Yes. Sorry? Share screen. Please you share screen, sir. Ah, to share screen. Ah, okay, okay, just one second, please. Uh, and then press press your button twice. Yeah, yeah. Sir, how, more, how much time each speaker, sir? Seven minutes. Ten minutes, I think. Yeah. Ten, yeah, ten minutes enough. for the first two speakers. Then, sir. Seven minutes. Yeah, your slides are on. Okay. Well, this is for. Okay. All right. Let me go to slideshow full screen. Okay, I think over the past uh, nearly 30 years at LV Prasad Eye Institute, we have developed a model of eye care delivery that is uh, a multi-tier, ranging from community-based primary care, focusing on a population unit of 5,000 people, to advanced tertiary care at our Hyderabad campus. Just a brief review about uh, our country. Uh, the latest report from the World Health Organization uh, is that we have still about 8.3 million blind people and an additional 40 million with serious vision impairment. And of course, on top of that, we still have to add the numbers of presbyopia and then uh, a number of people who require eye care. According to the recent World Report on Vision by the WHO organization, nearly 50% of all population in the world require some form of eye care all the time. So if you look at the main causes that cause blindness and vision impairment in our country, it's a cataract continues to take the lead, uncorrected refractive error, surgical complications, corneal scars, glaucoma, diabetic retinopathy, blindness in children and low vision. We also have to be cognizant of the fact we still have significant problems of inequity, gender inequity, socioeconomic inequity, as well as a, a large segment of geographic disparity. So addressing all these needs, uh, we have developed this integrated model of care. As I was mentioning to you from the community-based primary care at the bottom level, then the center-based primary care, then secondary level, then basic tertiary, and then finally the advanced tertiary. A, a care that is appropriate to that level, available to all people irrespective of their ability to pay, affordable and accessible from simple screening in remote rural areas to management of complex diseases. The scientific basis for this model came from our Andhra Pradesh IDC study, which we conducted in the late 90s, that has given us information on the prevalence, the major causes of blindness, barriers for seeking care, outcomes from cataract surgery, et cetera. Using that data and some of the teachings from the World Health Organization, I think our model has evolved. 
According to the World Health Report of the year 2000, good care is a person-centered care with a comprehensive and integrated responses and with continuity of care, with permanent presence in the communities, a regular and trusted provider at the entry point to care, and responsibility for a defined population and coordination of all the inputs from other levels of care. We all aspire, the entire world from Afghanistan to America is aspiring from comprehensive health care and in our case, comprehensive eye care. This encompasses prevention and health promotion, diagnosis and treatment of disease and rehabilitation of irreversible forms of vision loss. At the very bottom, we work with the many volunteers in the communities focusing on a population of 5,000 people. And these are our representatives, can be healthcare workers, teachers, somebody who is educated in these villages who help us uh, with eye health promotion, screening programs, referrals, surveillance of the people who underwent surgery, and then focusing on two vulnerable age groups, the pediatric and the geriatric. We have also introduced the technological tools in the recent past. This is a folding for after, which can allow us to screen for refractive errors within a minute. And the cost of this uh, tool is about 100 rupees. We have now supplied to many schools in the states where we are working uh, for school children's screening. At the next level, we have the center-based approach, a concept we developed about 25, 27 years ago called Vision Center, a primary eye care center, where the primary function is refraction and dispensing of spectacles because uncorrected refractive error constitutes more than half the vision problem in our country. The technician who is a high school graduate trained for a year can do that and also is trained to detect potentially blinding diseases and refer them to the next level. We also work there to link, form links with the local other healthcare and again, the post-operative follow-up. Each center is fully equipped with slit lamps, applination, tonometer, et cetera. And in the recent past, we have added things like OM, which is a visual field testing device, an innovation from our technology innovation center, and then also uh, a fundus camera uh, to take uh, pictures. And then we have teleophthalmology connectivity uh, to the higher centers. So the concept is simple, where an ophthalmologist is not required, and the technician is well-trained uh, to tackle these tasks, and then they are capable of understanding what the potentially blinding disease is and making necessary reference. So this is a gateway actually to, to help eye care uh, in the remote rural and tribal areas. Our vision centers are typically 95% of them are in remote rural and tribal areas. The system of universal access and then high quality and part of a sustainable system. 10 such centers are then linked to what we generically call service centers. This is secondary level care, where we used to have one ophthalmologist. Now we, in some centers, we have three to four uh, providing all secondary level services, typically in communities like this, in rural communities. Most of our secondary centers, again, are in rural areas. They are not in district headquarters. They are not in towns. They are only our focus is underserved areas. And here is a center gifted by a local industry to us. Uh, the support comes for capital from local industry or international organizations. Here we provide comprehensive care, diagnosis, surgery, predominantly cataract, used to be only cataract and some of the secondary level. More recently, we have begun to do corneal transplants, retinal surgery, pediatric, etc. We also incorporate low vision and community-based rehabilitation as an integral part of all these centers. And they monitor a cluster of 10 vision centers. And 90% of the staff who work in these centers are recruited from the local communities, trained and put back in their own communities. 
How do, we, how do we do corneal transplant as an example? A corneal specialist from tertiary center travels there once a month. The donor cornea from our central eye bank, followed by our trained comprehensive ophthalmologist who works in these centers. And we also use technology with the drone slit lamp where the patient is seated and we can examine the patient live from Hyderabad or Vishakhapatnam, wherever tertiary centers are. And we also have WhatsApp consultation and once a week, eco technology applied education tools to the doctors working in our secondary centers. More recently, we have also begun to look into complicated glaucoma, retinal problems, pediatric care, and plastics. Another new concept that we have introduced, considering the cost of high end diagnostic devices like OCT, et cetera. We have developed a diagnostic vehicle which goes and parks with each of the secondary centers for a week. And they, it rotates between five centers in adjacent geographic locations. So through this approach, uh, we can cover 90% of all the blinding and vision impairment problem, obviating the need for these people to have to travel to bigger cities for their care. Together, a secondary center with 10 vision centers and 100 vision guardians serve about 100 to 200 villages. They are then linked to next level tertiary centers where predominantly training, clinical research, et cetera, happens. And at the very top in Hyderabad, we call center of excellence where anything done anywhere in the world is done. Training of trainers, active research, model development, active participation, policy planning, advocacy, and resource mobilization. We now have a network of nearly 238 locations and predominantly three states with a little presence in Karnataka. And these are the 10 functional segments through which we work. And so the innovations are the model, need-based education programs, three-tier eye banking, stem cell transplantation, biology, et cetera. So in, in summary, it's a model for universal eye health, comprehensive care, commitment to quality, closer to the doorstep of the people who need it most, continuity of care with active community participation. Aligning very well with the World Report on Vision, which has come out recently. Even pandemic has proven that we have to think, rethink about the levels of care. We have to migrate care to secondary and primary levels eliminate distance for the people who need care, leverage technology, multi-tier paying and non-paying. With a combination of health systems innovations, HRD and research and innovation, we can certainly uh, achieve the aspirations of seeing a world uh, with no needless blindness. Thank you so much. A really impressive talk, really impressive talk. I was just going to ask one question, if I may. Uh, uh, are we are also working on uh, uh, a long range retinal evaluation for diabetes? Yes, yes. For the, in, on the, on, in the village category, Kedar? Yes, that's one of the focus areas. Uh, we have pilot districts where we screen the most of the population for diabetes with a grant from World Diabetes Federation. And then we have set up all the required equipment. We have three secondary and 30 vision centers in the district. So that like that, we created models and now we are replicating elsewhere. Thank you very much, sir. I think really now the, the need of the R is uh, to really get as close to the patients as we can, because I don't think in the near future, the patients will be traveling a lot because of uh, all these pandemic issues as well. So thank you very much, sir. And our next speaker is uh, Mr. Tulsi Raj, and uh, he's going to be sharing with us the Arvind uh, concept of self-sustaining community eye hospitals. Please unmute yourself. Yeah, I have unmuted. Uh, okay, yeah. You can hear me now? Yes, sir. Let me see the show, sir. Okay. okay, good. So um, I have, I guess, uh, 10 minutes, right? 
so when when people uh, talk about uh, sustainability i think they largely focus on the uh, financial aspect uh, but uh, i think we need to take a much more uh, comprehensive or a holistic perspective to sustainability it has to be it has to also include uh, human related uh, human resources uh, leadership you know demand being relevant and also uh, i've added environment so i'll be uh, touching on uh, each of these aspects less so directly on financial because i think uh, you recognize that it cuts through the entire uh, uh, all the points and I'll, i'll dwell a little more on the uh, environment part of it so all of us recognize that uh, our organizations depend a lot almost entirely on the human resources you now we often face one of these challenges either we don't have the right numbers you no know, or we don't have a pipeline for uh, meeting attrition or growth you no know, uh, around talent competence you no know, motivation being nice to patient etc so so the approach that we have taken to address this uh, which addresses pretty much all of those concerns is to develop a robust internal pipeline no so this is just a, a, an example of the mix uh, of uh, staff or full regular employees versus those in the training the trainees are essentially the pipeline you no know, so they are in training for two years or three years which gives us adequate time to build competence build the right values right attitude you know and and uh, all of that stuff uh, so since we are a fairly large organization we have the scale to do this in a, in a very different way having our own training uh, kind of an engine uh, but even smaller hospitals can really adopt this method you know of having internship and those apprenticeship there are very uh, many of op- uh, options and you found this to be a, a win win situation uh, in the sense that those in training get a career they they get a job you know so they, their own uh, life improves and for the hospital we are assured of a hr uh, a supply line and since all of this since the trainees also uh, work you know with patients to develop the skills etc uh, indirectly it also in some costing as less on the on the hr front uh, and this this is found to be a sustainable solution so for the last uh, uh, maybe a couple of decades we have had very little lateral entry and all the staffing happens through the uh, internal pipeline and another aspect when it comes to hr and to sustain uh, is to really make sure that um, uh, the staff are used well the reality is that uh, the salaries that we pay are picked to competence you now the doctors probably account for almost half your wage bill you now and then it also is true that those highly competent people are also become or also the bottleneck in the organization in in a, in a positive sense in the sense all care has to go through them so their productivity or how much they produce determines the output of the organization so as a result we need to kind of uh, make sure that we never underutilize a person so we do a lot of tasking in a very systematic manner Uh, essentially one person does one task sometimes two uh, at any given point of time they're they're often rotated between tasks so with the result uh, yeah yeah high skill development and good quality uh, uh, also happens in whatever they do and it, it also results in effective equipment utilization you know and all of this significantly reduces cost and increases throughput you know, which which also has a financial bearing Um, now the next aspect which is uh, if you take the continuum of care you know there are people who want to seek care you know if they can manage to come to the hospital you know be diagnosed you know and uh, if they are comply we're able to provide treatment but unconsciously most of us have put our boundaries as treating those who come to us that is diagnosis and giving a treatment advice and then those who are able to comply we provide the treatment so so we are kind of limiting uh, our boundary of uh, what we do and what we don't do 
Uh, and then one proposal I'm making is that if you can shift the boundaries to, to go to the community level to make sure that everyone who needs care is enabled to come and everybody who's advised is enabled to undergo the treatment. No, and, and then once you do that, I think the demand becomes more robust. And the other aspect is to kind of design to close the loop. You know, if you're running a vision center, make sure that they're able to get the medicines and the glasses, you know, locally. Otherwise, all the all that you do is a point of time goes waste because prescription never makes a patient better. So this is about uh, uh, plugging a lot of the leakages, you know, from getting from the patients from the community into the system. Are we advising them appropriately? And those advice, are they getting the surgery or not? And then once we intervene, is the outcome what it should be? No. So once we're able to kind of uh, close this whole loop, uh, the, the, the demand gets uh, much better. You know, because I think the outcomes become better, which reinforces demand. So, so, so this approach really is a win-win in the sense the patient gets better and then for the hospital, they have more patients. And then that translates to the top line, bottom line revenues and surplus. And uh, this, this, I believe, is what sustains and, and grows the demand over time. Uh, on the other aspect of sustaining is that we have to remain continually relevant you know, to the, to, to the uh, needs of the community, you know, which requires at one level uh, looking inward, you know, looking outward with benchmark and, and then continually improving what we do. And uh, this requires building a culture of learning, uh, you're building a culture of uh, humility that recognizes that you don't know it all at individual level and at organizational level. And then the leadership also has to keep a tab on what's happening outside, not just in uh, ophthalmology or eye care. For that, I think it happens automatically, but also what makes eye care happen. You know, on the technology front, on the, Dr. Rao mentioned a lot about harnessing uh, information technology uh, to do. So all of that has to happen to stay relevant. And that's a very a strong uh, leadership role. I'm going to spend a little more time on the environmental sustainability, but I say this because healthcare is a significant polluter of the carbon footprint, you know, and, and we threaten the sustainability in a, in a significant way. Uh, in the developed countries, almost 10% of the carbon footprint is accounted for by healthcare. Uh, fortunately, in developing countries, it is less, but, but we might catch up. So when it comes to resources, we have developed a model to address this. Now, this is infrastructure, you know, we, we kind of go for green buildings, reduce energy use, you know, or go for uh, renewable energies. I'll give some examples. Uh, significantly reduce the resource need, you know, like EMR completely reduces the need for paper, you know, standardization, you know, reuse, multi-use, recycling, uh, and then in the way you design the services, your processes and practice, again, have a, a huge uh, impact on reducing or increasing the carbon uh, footprint in terms of service design, equipment maintenance, how you procure your supplies, you know, your, your clinical protocols, and so on. So, so, so just for example, uh, uh, we, we kind of uh, monitor and do like a one-stop you no know, one visit service. You no, know, like if a person comes into the hospital, I mean they they kind of go with the solution, you know, in their hand. You know, if it is surgery, you know, we don't have any waiting list, so they can get operated the following day, and and so on. Uh, uh, and, and similarly, you know, if it is glasses, you know, eighty-five to ninety percent of them are delivered on the same day, which means they don't make multiple trips to get glasses. All of that reduces uh, carbon footprint as well as the cost to the patient. On the energy front, <clears throat> we have switched uh, significantly into green energy, or getting into purchase arrangements uh, from solar and, and wind energy uh, suppliers. These are not our assets, uh, but then over 80% of our power today is through renewable energy. And as a result of just the green energy, we're saving about 10 lakh rupees. Uh, a, a month, 
and then by also going through uh, methods of energy reduction we have another uh, 20 lakhs uh, roughly 30% saving on the uh, energy bill uh, also water management we have an organic water treatment plant which treats about uh, 20 lakh liters a day you no know, and also rain harvesting reducing water usage uh, and, and and so on having very lean protocols you no know, as a result the waste from our surgeries tend to be about 5% of uh, what is in the western world you know us or uk so in conclusion uh, your focus on environment also make sure that um, the community or the patients get the care more efficiently at a lower cost you no know? and for the hospital also you have um, uh, the care giving Uh, uh we get more patients and also at a, at a lower cost and then we're also reducing the the carbon footprint so i feel that this we have a new uh, uh kind of uh, opportunity now you know, which really creates a triple win you now make sure that all involved are um, uh, benefiting by this thank you thank you very much i think uh, the way to go is to be more sensitive towards the environment because you know if we are we would have been more sensitive probably we wouldn't have landed up in the pandemic issue also and um, thank you very much for your talk sir uh, our next speaker is um, uh, dr bhujan shetty and he'll be talking about compassion and i care so over you to sir thank you dr reena uh, well uh, i was with the patient uh, the other day and uh, he told me doctor if you don't mind i'd like to say something i said go ahead and he said doctor um it's no more vaidyo narayano hari but now it's become vaidyo narayano vari <laughs> well i asked him why is that so he says well we patients nowadays feel that uh, doctors and hospitals today are more interested in my pocket than my problem that will really interrupt sir please share your screen sir all right i have no slides i i am just no sir please click on share screen sir okay all right your ppt not visible sir please click on your ppt sir uh, i <laughs> He doesn't have a PPT. Please minimize this. I don't have a PPT. He doesn't have slides. Yeah, I have no slides. Yeah. Yes, yes. I, I have no slides. I'm just talking. All right. I, I have no. Sorry, I have no Sir? slides. I'm just talking, talk, talking offhand. So when he told me this, I was a little shaken, and I asked him. Uh, I mean, if that's the reason, that just shows that today the, our patients are. suspecting our own uh, our uh, our motives and that's the last thing that can happen to a doctor or an institute and uh, no wonder there is so much of conflict now between doctor and patient and atrocities on doctors and uh, you know cases on doctors i think there is uh, some room we can't always uh, blame the patient for everything we need to introspect and see exactly where uh, we have got wrong well what i feel that in, there is seems to be some communication gap between doctors and patients when a patient uh, walks in to our chamber uh, do we just see them as a number do we just see them as a patient or a, or a customer or a guest or i feel that we should treat them as our own kith and kin that's when we you build a rapport with our patients and that's when the trust between a patient and a doctor develops and now of course uh, we are all you know such big hurry we see huge number of patients but when a patient is in front of us he he must have waited for hours to get to see us and then he spends about 5 10 minutes in our chambers i think it is his right that we give him not 100% but 200% of our attention well uh first thing is that when as soon as he starts you know, talking we we are notorious for you know hardly giving him 
uh, two sentences and then we start examining him, especially in ophthalmology, I think we know, know it all. We've already come to a diagnosis. Things are very simple. But then we need to hear the patient out. We need to give him some time to tell his story. Maybe you, you, you may feel it is irrelevant, but for him, it is very, very important. And most important is when a patient is sitting there, you know, we tend to get distracted, especially by this phone of ours. And that we need to avoid. And uh, anytime we lift a phone when a patient is there, he definitely feels that, you know, doctor is not giving me the attention that is due. He's distracted. Maybe he's forgotten what I complained about. So that's one thing we can definitely avoid. And at the end of the day, you know, patients also know that, you know, doctors are not gods. But he must go out, walk out of our chamber, feeling totally satisfied that doctor has done his best. And if so, if a patient, he may not get cured, not all, all of them will, but still, if the patient feels that you have done your best, he will be happy and he'll be satisfied. And then once a satisfied patient walks out, he becomes your fan for life. He keeps singing your praises. And if you have such patients, you really don't need a marketing team because that becomes your base, that becomes your foundation. And you'll be soon having thousands of people working free for you and marketing your hospital and your name. I don't think there's a better base than this. However much advertisement you may do, however much marketing you may do, nothing like a patient you know, talking about you and telling about your hospital. That is the best ba base that we can have. So I, sh I think we should all depend more on our patients to, you know, tell about our hospital and our work than anything else. But then we, 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 we see different kinds of patients and we have different yardsticks for different class of patients. Well, when a wealthy patient walks in, he, of course, he pays well. We, it is necessary. I don't say uh, money is uh, not important, but the problem starts when you make it all important. Our patient care must be first. That must be our first priority. So I keep telling my people, patients first, always and every time. If we put our patients above everything else, then everything else follows, including um, your wealth, name, fame, everything will chase you. You really don't have to chase these things. That's my feeling. So when a wealthy patient comes, of course, we see them well, they do pay us well, but they also demand their flush, uh, pound of flesh. So they sometimes keep bugging you, keep asking multiple questions. They, they, they are worried. They keep window shopping. And so many problems are there. It's not easy. But when an underprivileged patient comes, we should realize that he also requires the equal amount of attention and care that we give a, you know, a well-to-do patient. For this reason, I'll tell you why. When you treat an underprivileged patient, maybe he doesn't pay or you sometimes you may even do it free for him, but he will be so grateful to you that he will, he will uh, you know, bless you, he will pray for you. And I've even seen some of them worship you. These things are absolutely you know, uh, more important than money. And I always feel these blessings from these patients are extremely important. Uh, because you don't know when, however big, however popular, however powerful you are, when you will get caught in some you know, crossfire, when you will get into trouble. And it, at that time, it is these blessings from these patients that come to our rescue. And there we will be saved. So I always feel that we need to give this, the underprivileged uh, patients all the attention that they require. And uh, I really look up to institutes like uh, uh, Arvind and LVP and Shankar Netralaya who have done great work. And I, I feel that it's not necessary that, you know, that only such institutes can, uh, trust institutes can have this model. Even individual practitioners, we could definitely spare some of our time and some of our resources for the underprivileged and we should. So for me, compassion is nothing but treating others as you would like them to treat you. Compassion, is putting yourself in the patient's shoes. Compassion is 
uh, being a good human being. So I truly feel that uh, if you can show me a good human being, I'll show you a good doctor. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for a lovely talk right from the heart. Compassion in IK. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, our uh, next talk is from Dr. Debashi Bhattacharya. He's going to be speaking on being affordable in eye care delivery. Good evening, everybody. Being affordable is a wonderful thing. And uh, Bhujang, uh, sorry, without a slide today, you are not a speaker, really. That's what system and technology has paralyzed us. So uh, essentially, when we go out to serve patients, this is the first question every doctor asks. What does the patient want? Well, to be honest, he wants everything. He wants the best chair time, the best doctor, at the least uh, in his most convenient time. But the most relevant question lies that what is he actually willing to pay for? So it is a journey from where we take affordability first and bring him to aspire the entire community and a patient as such. Now, we have uh, wonderful stats uh, from the industry around uh, the uh, affordability and whom we need to focus on. So almost uh, 35 lakhs of our 65 lakh cataracts are lenses below uh, 200 rupees. So essentially that matches with the per capita monthly income. Now the next category is another 40% uh, which fits into a per capita monthly income of eight to 24,000. And then comes the premium group and uh, this adds to the total. So if we really want to be, where would we like to place ourselves? I think a very strategic and choice would be to be around here because it would allow us to go both ways and uh, definitely uh, be uh, very relevant in a private practice setup uh, scenario. Now, if we take uh, the uh, intra, uh, anti of injection market, I mean, it's from the industry. We see that we just do 3.3 lakhs. It's only 120th of our total cataract volume, but in the Western world, it's one to two times of the cataract surgery, which says how little we have percolated into comprehensive eye care down to the last mile or the last person. So essentially, there is a huge scope of improvement at that. And here, this also points that because these injections are costly, the treatments are probably deferred, denied, or not accessed to. Now, if we say fair price, now obviously a fair price and a transparent way of providing it definitely uh, brings in the faith that Bhujan was talking about. And this uh, faith, once coming into the institution, he knows about newer things and that aspires him to a higher uh, level of uh, um, care acquisition. And word of mouth publicity is perhaps what we get from a happy patient. And that is perhaps the strongest marketing and of course becomes very relevant for a social marketing point of view. Now, this starts the inclusive ball game. Otherwise, you know, we, as individuals, we try to be exclusive and it gives us a very quick break even uh, in private practice and the opportunity to scale. And we can uh, improvise to improve technology systems and the entire va value chain with the human resource, the empathy and carry forward the uh, building up an organization and the ability to replicate and perpetuate, which obviously is a goal of any hard work. So pricing considerations, uh, we would consider how to price your services. Most of us end up doing shadow pricing. Location, we would say it should be three times, a cataract surgery should be three times the 
square feet cost of the residential standard residential area. The segment we want to serve, the first thing we understand is the staff should avail a standard uh, treatment in that hospital where they work. And uh, we would pay the OPD expenses as one day per capita um, is a standard OPD expense. And we should understand that any discounts, free service training, which is not consumed in the practice, is an expense and should be you know, paid, uh, should be made provision for. And lower the price, better would be the compliance is obvious and the price can obviously be escalated through economies of scale and costs can be reduced by converting fixed into semi-variable costs like part-time consultants, uh, buying equipments in um, EMIs or bundling, bundling equipments, etc. And the price changes should be incremental. So having said that, this is how our uh, scenario works out. And our average cataract surgery price is uh, 17,000 and the average OPD spend is around 720 per patient. So the vision at operation hasn't quite improved over the years, uh, as you see, and the cataract surgical rate. So that is why we say that probably we have done much more in the cataract segment and probably was expected. The economies of scale work like this, that the doctors don't want to do IO. Now, if a 500 patients a day hospital buys uh, Optos, I mean, it, we can offer it at rupees 300 and still be relevant. And uh, it gives better compliance, better peripheral uh, lesions. So uh, we can afford laminar flow theaters. So this is how we, our journey went on. Uh, over the years where we just moved on from one hospital to the other um, as we got 550 patients from uh, geography um, in the rural or the some semi-rural belt, it would be around uh, 100 kilometers and in the urban area, it would be around 25 kilometers. So uh, this would be, uh, this is how we branched into 15 hospitals over the years. And uh, we took uh, affordable eye care to our patients. Um, so having said that, uh, this has been our growth in the OPD and uh, this has been the IPD surgery stats. And uh, this has been the the COVID year is uh, shown that we have 20% deficit. This is what we want to do in future. And uh, we would conclude by saying that low cost is not low quality. When you focus on quality, you pick up means where you can give quality at low cost. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. All lies in simplification that we reach this point. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, any modifications you made during this pandemic? I mean, like everywhere uh, there's been a down in the OPDs as well as the surgeries as well. So, but when so you have to thing, the big staff. One thing, yeah. one thing we didn't do is we didn't close our hospitals, any of these hospitals for even a day. Right. And uh, the teleconsultation was a new platform for us. We started it. Uh, of course, you know, in the month of... Uh, March, I think we, or, or April, we did only 20, 29 lakhs. So, I mean, uh, yes, it was very bad, but uh, I think there is a lot of, uh, you know, um, pent up demand waiting in the lines and it will come back as things normalize, so. I'm sure. But, yeah. Thank you very much. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Radhika Tandon and she'll be talking about research at the Apex Institute. Thank you and good evening everyone. I'm going to try and give an insight into the research at the RP Center in the very short time. Uh, everybody is familiar with the RP Center uh, where we have, uh, as with all other institutes, a combination of patient care, teaching and research. And uh, we have the emblem, which re represents what we do, the motto of Tamsoma Jyotirgamai and, and our anthem. So, um, 
the late professor L.P. Agarwal established the center and his vision is uh, so rewarding even today. Uh, we've had a whole host of chiefs who've carried his message forward and brought us to this point of time in 2021. It serves as a temple of learning and a fountain of knowledge and is an oasis for patient care. But talking about the research aspect is very much a part of what we do. Giving you a little insight into how the institution from darkness to light. Dr. Rajendra Prasad Center for Ophthalmic Sciences was established by the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, Government of India in 1967 as a national center for ophthalmic sciences to provide state-of-the-art patient care to the common man. Dr. L.P. Agarwal the founder chief of the center was a visionary who envisaged a standalone comprehensive ophthalmic center that would be at the forefront of the eye health planning academics and clinical care The center is a constituent ophthalmic services unit of the All India Institute of Medical Sciences. Dr. R.P. Center is spread across a standalone seven floor building as 300 bedded facility catering to a footfall of more than five lakh patients per year. Dr. R.P. Center has the largest ophthalmic residency training program in the world with over 250 ophthalmology residents training in basic and advanced ophthalmology with 40 several faculties comprising of six clinical units of excellence catering to different ophthalmology specialities clinical services to retina and uvea cataract and refractive cornea and ocular surface ophthalmoplasty and ocular oncology squint and neuro-ophthalmology, ophthalmic anesthesia and ophthalmic related basic sciences of community ophthalmology, ocular pharmacology and microbiology. This center is also one of the leading facilities in the country, publishing medical literature on clinical and basic sciences research. Unit 1 caters to cataract, refractive, and pediatric cataract services, along with retina and uvea services. A large volume of children of all ages with cataract is examined and operated upon providing them with optimal visual rehabilitation. Unit 2 caters to retina and uvea, along with ROP services. All advanced and complex retinal surgical treatments are available. The special pediatric neonatal unit caters to comprehensive ROP services for the premature babies with retinal problems. Unit 3 caters to cataract and refractive cornea and ocular surface services. World class facilities for femtosecond assisted cataract and refractive surgery is performed in high volume throughout the year. Unit 4 caters to glaucoma, squint, and neuro-ophthalmology services, advanced care facilities for glaucoma clinical, laboratory, and research facilities are accessible to all patients. Unit 5 caters to squint, neuro-ophthalmology, and oculoplasty services. Children and adults with a wide variety of squint problems and complex neuro-ophthalmology disease are thoroughly examined and taken care with the world-class surgical procedures. Unit 6 offers to cornea and ocular surface, cataract and refractive services along with ocular oncology services. State-of-the-art facilities in corneal transplantation with all recent advanced surgical procedures, keratoprosthesis services, and stem cell transplantation services are possible here. Ocular oncology, inclusive of comprehensive retinoblastoma care services, is provided. Serving both. 
so uh, as you can see, there's a whole range of uh, facilities and the research is linked to what is going on. Uh, I'll just give you a snapshot of, um, of what we've done, say, in the, according to the annual report of 2019 and 20. A lot of the work is clinical, but also we have research which is pre and paraclinical involving community ophthalmology, optometry and vision sciences. Apart from the research which is done in-house, there is also outreach work for the National Program for Control of Blindness. There are several surveys which are conducted. Uh, there is the NPCBVI National Diabetes and Diabetes Retinopathy Survey, which has been done, plus the National Blindness and Visual Impairment Survey 2019. The National Survey on Human Resource and Infrastructure for Eye Care Services in India. And now there's a vision atlas. This website is available and accessible if one wants to know the updated data on national blindness and visual impairment surveys. Uh, the elimination of active trachoma has been confirmed by the survey conducted by the RP Center for the NPCB and a community-based survey for the prevalence on the childhood causes of blindness has been published recently. Operational research using ASHA volunteers as well as a multi-center collaborative study are just few of the other examples of research going on. As you can see, it's a huge institute with a lot of people and the research output. Uh, we have several research projects ongoing and completed. And the publications for the last year were 390 papers and innumerable abstracts. Of course, the institute is led uh, and the work is led by the very, very talented and dedicated faculty, uh, not to forget all the students as well as staff. Uh, so with that, I'll stop here, and I hope it has been, I've been able to cover a, a peep into the research work going on at the Apex Institute. Thank you, Dr. Radhika. That was very nice. Normally, you have most of the corporate showing you what all work in the different departments, and it's nice in you we've had today of our center. Thank you very much. Our uh, next speaker is uh, Dr. S.S. Pandav. And he's going to be talking about the academics and clinics in the government. Uh, thank you, <clears throat> Chairman, sir, and AIUS for including us into this program. Uh, PJ Chandigarh was uh, started as Institute of National Importance uh, by the government of India uh, with a mandate to provide high quality patient care, self-sufficiency in postgraduate medical training, also to train teachers and leaders in ophthalmology and other, other specialties of medicine, training healthcare uh, personnel, and also conduct research which is relevant to our society. So this is the mission statement, a service to the community, care of the needy and research for the good of all. So all this boils down to basically is that we have a good patient care. The patient is at the heart of these activities and uh, that's the end user. So whatever our efforts are, they should be to provide good care to our population. And what we mean by good care is basically that the care should be accessible uh, to all. It should be equitable, it should be affordable, and it should be of high quality. The discussion today is, uh, for me, is that how do we position our clinics and academics to provide that kind of a care to our community? So my point of view is that uh, the academics, the clinics, and the patient care, they are actually integral part of the same system. Uh, you can't really separate them. You know, you can't take out one of them without affecting adversely the other two. So they all have to be integrated because to provide good patient care, you need a good physician, a good clinical setup, and, you know, trained manpower. And that the process of providing a good care actually results in a good experience, which improve the skills of the treating physicians and also provides interaction and uh, leads to opportunities to do more research, which again adds to the academic knowledge. And that knowledge again percolates down to the clinics, to the treating doctors, and they provide better care to the society. So this is a, a cycle which, is, uh, which has a positive loop, I would say is a magic cycle. And uh, this is very important for the continued healthcare uh, improvement in the healthcare delivery system and also to the improvement of the quality of the services. So in PGI, we, uh, we try to provide the highest quality care uh, to our population, which is accessible. So our 
hospital is actually is a even if it's a tertiary eye care center, but we allow walk-in patients. We have a referral refer program. Uh, we also have a appointment system, but we don't follow it very strictly because uh, people do get blocked out if you're too strict in this. So we allow patients to come in and even without appointment. Uh, we provide services to all without any you know, differentiation in the poor or rich or differentiation based on caste, creed or religion or status of the person and also without any geographical boundaries. So we see patients from all over India and also uh, abroad. Uh, our care is very nominally charged actually and uh, uh, is almost free uh, to, to most of the needy patients. So we also are part of the Ayushman Bharat scheme, which is an kind of insurance uh, program for the poor patients. And a lot of people are benefited with that. Uh, even the high-end procedure like LASIK, SMILE, femtocatec surgery, uh, they are highly subsidized at our center. We have a very well-trained staff and well-equipped clinics uh, to provide state-of-the-art and excellent care to our population. The organizational services is based on subspeciality. We have a, a general OPD where, and also community, community ophthalmology uh, going and where patient, patient can, can actually walk in and uh, without any appointment have, a, 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 have their uh, you know, problem sorted. Uh, we also have uh, clinics like cornea clinics or refractive surgery, retina, ROP, uveitis, glaucoma, pediatric ophthalmology. Uh, and many other clinics. And all these clinics are you know, very well supported by clinical labs, as well as research lab operation theaters, and also wet labs for the training of our residents. So academic programs, uh, we run a number of academic programs and we have a very well structured and robust uh, program, uh, which has been running over the years. So we have a junior residency, which is for three years. We have senior residency, another three years. Uh, we also have fellowships, uh, one-year fellowship in glaucoma. We have started MCH program for advanced subspecialty training in retina and uh, cornea. Uh, we have a number of PhDs working in our laboratories. We have also have an optometry uh, school of optometry. And in, in addition, we have several observerships positions and also short-term training programs, which we organize, which are open to other, uh, other hospitals in the region. And many people from the government organizations, they actually visit us from time to time. In addition, our faculty contributes to almost a, a number of conferences, et cetera, throughout the year. Uh, we are also uh, uh, at the forefront in research. And uh, uh, because of the very good lab setup and also very good clinical setup, uh, we are a place where the bridging the gap between the clinicians and scientists is actually uh, can be done and we look forward to people uh, joining us uh, here so that we can do more research. The PGI has contributed over 1600 such papers this year alone and out of that about 200 were uh, contributed by the eye research, uh, uh, eye uh, advanced eye center. So PGI is uh, a success story, advanced eye center is a success story. We are number one designation destination for patients in this region for uh, patient uh, care. Uh, our alumni are occupying very high positions uh, in many organizations in India as well as abroad. And we are usually among the top five in terms of providing clinical services and also in terms of research uh, output. Uh, being a government organization is a great help to us actually because we don't have to worry about generating funds. Our staff's salaries, equipment, infrastructure, projects, staff development projects, they are all taken care of by the government. Uh, that's the reason we can be more accessible to people and also we are, can be very economical. But this all is happening because we take care of our population. We keep the patient in the center of vision and our activities are actually, uh, you know, all, uh, they revolve around this patient. And this is very, this also helps because we generate a lot of happy patient. And as uh, Dr. Bojang Shetty said in his talk, uh, happy patients are the best investors and they go back to, you know, to the decision makers or policy makers to give a good feedback and that helps us generate more funds. So, to summarize, the good clinics and good academics programs are, they go uh, hand in hand, they are not inseparable. Uh, excellence in patient care is of fundamental importance and the government institutions can provide accessible, equitable, affordable and excellent care. Thank you very much uh, for giving this opportunity to speak. Thank you.
thank you very much. Uh, it was a lovely in view of uh, the, all the good work you're doing at PGI and the uh, eye care that you're providing to people with, uh, you know, thank all you. status. Thank you. Anything anybody would like to add or ask? I think we can go to the next speaker. Um, the next speaker is Dr. K.K. Mehta, the king of Mumbai, and he's going to tell you how he's practicing like a king. I almost feel shy speak in the middle of this session, which have kings like L.V. Prasad and uh, a whole host of other internationally and nationally famous organizations. I'm basically a private practitioner. And I'm going to talk to you on something totally different. I'm going to talk to you on how you practice literally as a king. When... Partha Viswas told me that I have to speak in this session. I told him, I am a misfit here. Why are you putting me here? He says, we want to know how you manage. So I said, okay. So this is my talk. We know as a person, we are now talking to you as a general practitioner who is now going to increase his effort. If you remember the last slide of our talk from Chandigarh, Dr. Pandev said, no pressure on generating funds. I am a practitioner. For me, there's great pressure on generating funds. So we start with that. Every, you know, may know everything about ophthalmology, but the most important commodity is marketing yourself. Now, when you market and sell, you sell a system which is known as sell the sizzle, not the steak. What it means essentially is... It's the most popular axiom in advertising. It means that instead of selling the product itself, you must want to make the patient want it or need it. In other words, an emotional response has to be created within the customer. To give an example, when you buy a car, you have a certain vehicle and a minimum price. You want to reach out to a potential customer. You want him to make him feel how a car feels like. Will it make him feel safer? Will it be cooler if he buys this car? Will he be willing to go? And that is essentially what we need to do. A classical is a literal ad. It doesn't talk about the soap. It doesn't talk about anything. It just talks about how happy the lady is after utilizing literal soap. So this is essentially what you need to do as far as it is concerned. So you sell the sizzle, not the steak. You sell the benefit, not the features. You sell what people want, not what they need. Unfortunately, people buy on emotion. An important fact, face it, people don't care how long you've struggled, how much you've invested, how many years of your life. They want from the customer's point of view, it is very simple. What is in it for the customer? And that is what you have to satisfy. A person needs to decrease his number, even a single LASIK, a simple LASIK will do. He wants to get a better procedure, he has to go for a femtoal LASIK or smile. And how do you make him to go for the latter procedure? You sell the sizzle, you tell, sell the benefits, better vision, sharper vision, minimal complication, and the important what we call is brag factor. You tell your friends you had the newest procedure done and better long-term benefits. And remember in the end, no one is more important than yourself. Remember to sell yourself, not a machine. Unfortunately, nowadays, if you see brochures of doctors from all over, the brochures are filled with pictures of machines on both sides. Uh, why are you selling the machine of the company? For God's sake, sell yourself. You are unique. A machine is not. Today you have it. Tomorrow your next door neighbor will have it. If you stress on the machine, there will be no differentiator. Always stress your abilities. In a similar vein, stress on the surgeon. Not the machine. People say, I have got this LASIK machine. Yeah, usme kya hai? People are not bothered about what machine you have. When was the last time you went to a five-star hotel and asked us to what sort of what cooking range is the is the chef cooking my food on? You're not even interested. You're interested in the ambience. So sell the uniqueness of the operator, not the vehicle or the medium. You are special. Send the unique level. For example, there are multiple lasers. There are no differentiations, but the operators are unique. Remember, it's the driver, not the car, which wins the race. And you have to tell the patient that. It is the jockey, not the horse that wins the race. Neither. So you stress on your assets as a surgeon. 
your success rates, the number of years you've been practicing, the good results you're having, where you get patients from so far. And when you sell cataracts, refractive procedures, even start smile, stress the benefit, not the procedure. Don't run and say it is a new procedure. The advantages of 24 are good vision, ability to get 180 degree, no poking, etc. As we say, sell the sizzle, not the steak. Sell long-term benefits. Always stress on long-term. Advisor, she is not buying a shoe or chappal or a costly bag. This is forever. So when you have to sell a lens, especially, you suggest them that this is something you're going to be using for a prolonged period of time. And how to differentiate yourself in a, in a market which is very competitive, like, for example, where I live in Bombay. You are born unique. Focus on yourself. Sell yourself. And, of course, a very fundamental thing. Don't make patients wait in a waiting room. Nobody likes waiting. First of all, remove, remove the name waiting and call it reception room. And try to keep your appointments and make sure your signages outside are adequate. Irrespective of how small a clinic you practice in, the biggest thing in your practice should be your signboard. And the key to a success, practice, successful practice is availability. You should be available to your patient all the time. And they have to know that you are available. Email, phone access should be available on a 24-hour basis. More so if you handle email patients. And of course, social marketing, a powerful tool. You need to be able to target your audience carefully. Use Google. It works well. Use Facebook. But update often. People put one page and they stick on it as if it is an adhesive. Change it. Bottom line, be enough time to at least a few topics every week. And healthcare on Instagram. Instagram is one of the most important social networks. Practice well and all will bow, bow before you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Keki. That was wonderful. I mean, like in a, in a solo practice and to do achieve what all you've achieved today, I think it's very commendable. Thank you so much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dr. Ajay Sharma, and he'll be giving us the IQ model, expanding IQ. Dr. Ajay Sharma there? No, ma'am. So is uh, Dr. G oh, yeah, Dr. Gishao is here, and uh, he's going to be talking about ensuring growth over the decades at the Premium Institute. Is my slide visible? Yes, it is. So uh, it on slideshow, I think. Okay. Perfect. So I'd like to thank the. Uh, Scientific Committee for this invite to talk on ensuring growth over a decade uh, at Shankar Nitralaya. As uh, Sri Nani Palkiwala called Shankar Nitralaya the temple of the eye, and temples live for posterity on devotion and love. If I were to summarize Shankar Nitralaya growth over the decades, I would use the Greenia growth model, which depicts the various phases of growth and also the potential crisis along the way. We all know that all organizations start small and young, and over the years may grow in size to become a more stable, mature organization, and with an extra effort could even go on to become an iconic organization. It all starts with a spark of an idea, usually by a visionary individual coming together of small, creative, but an agile team, which is very responsive and informally structured. What is vital here is the leadership. As the organization grows, managers are hired, processes are set in, culture is embedded, and the decision making becomes slightly decentralized. Well, the challenge here is in the leeway given to take independent decisions. Further growth calls for specialists with special skill sets who are accountable for the decisions. This frees the leadership to focus on 
market data, strategic decision and business planning. Obviously, this is also a period which sees jostling within the organization for control. The next is the growth through coordination, which is also known as the mature phase of an organization because it's here that the roles and responsibilities are very clearly defined and processes are set in place and all the departments work in harmony. But as long as there is no red tape is in the system. Next is the most daunting phase in an organization where the main concern is to ensure continued growth in the face of external challenges. The answers could be internal. If the employees if the culture in the organization encourages the employee to contribute ideas freely and gives each individual a feeling that his or her work impacts the organization. This instills a feeling of ownership in the organization. The next step is the stage where alliances are sought. There could be mergers and acquisitions. All this while trying to retain the identity of the organization. In other words, we could, we have two choices, either to evolve or repeat. Evolve and embrace something new or diversify or repeat what has been our tried and tested mantra of success over the years. But remember, if you want something you've never had, You've got to do something that you have never done before. Let's look at how vision, people, and processes can ultimately lead us to success. And over the next few slides, I shall share one of the last presentations of made by our founder, Dr. S.S. Badrinath, recently, highlighting some of the top uniqueness of Shankar Netralaya. The foundation of this organization, Shankar Nitrale, is the very clear vision and mission policy statements of the organization. Statements which are ingrained in each employee. A state of art infrastructure, equipment delivering excellent quality eye care to all at an affordable rate, which is carried out with a missionary zeal by the staff who consider that work is worship and they would do it with dedication, sincerity and utmost love. This is the basis of the success. Also, one needs to keep up, updated with technology, providing state-of-art eye care, be it for surgeries or for diagnostics. As we have seen with some of the previous presentations, taking these, at least some of these technologies to the doorstep of rural India to have an inclusive global ophthalmic care in the form of camps focused on cataracts, glaucoma, diabetes, pediatric ophthalmology, or even taking the operation theater to their doorsteps. This is what would uh, give us a very comprehensive and all-inclusive growth. As Dr. K.K. Mehta just said, we know that ultimately it's not the machine, but the man or the woman behind the machine who makes the difference. There has been a conscious and sustained effort at the part of Shankar Nitrale to impart quality of thalmic education and training to all cadres of healthcare professionals to ensure a ready availability of highly skilled manpower to address the short-term and long-term needs of the organization and the society. The challenges with a mature organization is the manpower retention. This is a stage where there is a mix of seniors, the mid-level and the freshers in the system. The seniors need to be given the leadership role in the areas of their core competence and have the independence in decision-making. The mid-level staff need to have a clear career path ahead and also need opportunities for their skill upgrades. Whereas the freshers 
will need monitoring and holding as they take care of bulk of this paid work in the organization. So it's an inclusive growth for each and every individual in the organization. And ultimately it's up to the management to identify the skill sets in each individual so that the work can be delegated for maximum output. The aim is to create an institute of good. Individual recognition is just essential along the way. The emphasis is on quality driven by sound processes, which is of paramount importance. It is also pertinent to understand the importance of basic science research with focus on ophthalmology, as uh, Dr. Radhika Tendon has just uh, emphasized. It could be through genetics, nanobiotechnology, pathology, bioinformatics, besides the uh, usual biochemistry, microbiology, or pathology, which enriches science and brings global recognition to the organization and attracts talent into the organization. Collaborations with, for capacity building in like-minded institutes across the nation and abroad helps expand the horizons of our own organization. In challenging times, especially like this pandemic, one needs to embrace new, newer concepts and technologies and exploit its features like artificial intelligence or teleconsultation, which helps us not only to stay connected with our patrons, but also helps us to reach out to newer pastures. The other in interesting thing which could be done is to encourage the tech nerds, for example, in an organization to use this lockdown period to think out of the box and come out with probably healthcare apps for the benefit of ophthalmologists, patients, or the public. In short, you need to remember that there is only one growth strategy that works, and that is work hard. And also remember, growth and comfort do not coexist. So you really need to work cohesively, work strategically, and with a sound vision, mission, and philosophy of the organization to expand your horizons. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Girish Rao, for your wonderful insight to Shankar Netrale's vision and uh, the mission. Um, over to the last speaker, Dr. Love, and he's going to be talking on uh, managing finances and group practice. Thank you, madam. And uh, is my slide visible? It is. Yeah. Thank you so much. And uh, uh, it's a great opportunity to be speaking in this August gathering. And first, I was a bit daunted seeing the speakers. So just a brief background of our group. And these are the mentors with which we have worked. Most of us have uh, spent our time mostly in a, a, a bigger institutes like Shankar Netrale, Arvind, and then at every level, we had mentors with, with whom we interacted. And at young age, we got into entrepreneurship and due to this, this exposure of ours. To add to this list, uh, almost three years, three to four years, we have very closely worked with Dr. Badrinath and Dr. Devi Shetty also. So that exposure helped us. And uh, we are mainly a doctor-owned group practice. and. Uh, to some extent, we are one of the largest group practice uh, anywhere in India. And the advantages of which is the capital expenditure is less and the space use, utilization is the best, proportionately the best earning potential for doctors. And one good thing is that we get the best of talent, better referrals, because all of us are practicing under one uh, roof. So we can uh, cro uh, have cross referrals among ourselves. Academically, all of us are quite active and definitely patients are uh, taken care of when uh, we are not there. Some disadvantages of large group practice is definitely when you have so many high level practitioners under one roof, you have ego clashes. Generation gap, I would say now, now with uh, almost 15 years, the, the age group in which we are working is roughly between 35 to 60 years of age. 
too many leaders are there all of us doing well so that thing but when communication channels are open all these can be uh, solved out very easily our hospital is not very cash rich but it uh, it does affect expansion but that is not our core focus risk is disintegration of team so that we have to constantly work upon and the solution is to select the team with very uh, utmost caution the leaders have to sacrifice the most everyone is allowed to pursue their own ambition without hurting the interest of others legally and ethically we have to be correct that we have be, we have been very cautious about and system has to be fair our system mostly some of us are owners some are not owners but system is more or less same for owners and non owners and many things we do let go and that has helped us in uh, keeping the system alive and it started with one doctor which uh, many of uh, the doctors in the panel would be aware of them dr uh, uh, pk bakshi started it and was very uh, successfully carried over by dr patho biswas and dr ajay paul and one important thing dr bakshi used to tell us uh, that hath mein thoda hunar ho kismat ho and take care of health things will fall in place and take care of health he would always pray uh, Uh, stress upon and then we went to the how we expanded this is the second uh, hospital we had which we had a bigger team newer partners and younger team was uh, encouraged to take the lead that is where i came into the picture and this is the center we started running uh, way back a, a, almost 8 years back and then the third center came up and finally we have our own uh, hospital which is called netralayam and uh, another center is coming up which is called three netralaya this this hospital was inaugurated on 1st of january uh, this year and uh, just to give a case study how our sim sim uh, center works almost uh, as i told all of us are uh, sn or arvin trained all are self employed we don't have salaried consultants and professional fee of the uh, the doctors are free to charge their own professional fee opd rates we have kept uh, standard but ot charges uh, vary from consultant to consultant we don't charge for uh, cross consultation and it's a private limited firm so it is a better structured uh, than a partnership firm ownership is again uh, is among doctors only and investment uh, is proportionate and that that is how the shares were distributed and income of doctors are their own professional charges for owners it is the dividend and another important thing is the valuation of the company which gives us a exit plan at any point uh, if one doctor wants to exit we started with a very small investment of 1.5 crores and most of the equipments were bought on deferred payment and we started with a 10000 square feet and now we are a group of almost 30 consultants who all of them are self employed return on investment for the promoters is almost 20% per year and in the facility we have almost everything except lasik and femto revenue share just for uh, um, uh, some idea uh, when pay, our opd charges are around 700 200 goes to the center and 500 to the consultant for diagnostic procedures 100% goes to the consultant we don't give any cuts to any doctor to be ethically correct and we have kept ot charge at around 8000 presently it is around 8400 so for a total package of surgery the center uh, earns only 8400 and that is mainly for the cataract and the vr procedures and then also we are sustaining so that is why our system generates interest in lot of uh, people concessions we, the all consultants are free to decide on their own consultations uh, uh, the uh, concessions and the, there is a proportionate decrease human resources every consultant has about 2 to 5 employees of their own and hospital has about 75 employees and then coming to the finances of the center which was the topic of today's discussion i'll just take one minute extra from the allotted time and uh, our gross revenue was around uh, uh, 12.2 crores in which the net income came to about 2 crore approximate in which some part of it was div div given as dividend just to see at the growth 
we have uh, started with 9500 patients on first year now once the this vip center itself is about 40000 patients per year surgery first year was 1000 now we are at uh, 4400 this doesn't include our second center which is uh, netralem which started this year so growth, growth wise it has been quite good and if you see growth in percentage terms first year, uh, earlier the was very low and then in 2019-20, we had a 12% dip. And in COVID year, we had just 7% dip in the whole year. And uh, now the returns are in uh, what, uh, how have we gained? We have gained uh, from investment as per shareholding returns is in uh, the individual practices over the years have grown many fold. Shareholders have got dividend and valuation of the company. We started with a capital of 10 lakhs. Now we have given a, a extra bonus shares and it is now 66 crores, which is 60 times more than the original thing. Partner gains with the new ventures and uh, the basic philosophy is ownership of doctors. Consultants are our, are our strength. There are no non-medical investors. There is no pressure of EMIs. So that helps us in being ethically correct. The last slide, the criticism, this model has been discussed. And one important thing is that we are relevant because it is being discussed. And most of the top institutes of Eastern India are keeping an eye on us. And one of the criticism is that we do not create value of the company. But we have to understand that by value of the company, we mean in a private limited company with the owners of the company. So value is created only for the owners in our system. The wealth distribution is so even among doctors that even the doctors who are non-owners earn almost at par with the owner doctors and almost in 10 years time they are financially more or less secure and so that they need not worry about their own future and for doctors who are con and mainly it is for doctors who are confident in building their own practice and don't want to get trapped in salary incentive system of the corporate hospitals that is where that is the space we are occupying Thank you so much. That was a lovely insight to your uh, model. Now, in a model like that, what exactly do you have in an exit policy? I mean, like if supposing you have a group of doctors leaving, then how would you manage that? I mean, just for 30, example, 30, yep. 30 doctors in your uh, uh, practice. So if a chunk no, of all. doctors decide to leave, how would you manage that situation? Of the 30 doctors practicing with us, only six are owners. Okay. So the exit policy is only for the owners. For practicing doctors, they can leave anytime. And for owners, just for example, what I showed in my slide, we started with a capital of 10 lakhs. The rest was loan to the company and other things. So that went back to the, that we all repaid. And with 10 lakhs in eight years time, our company now is valued at uh, six crores. So that is 60 time appreciation of the initial capital. So any, any owner who wants to exit now, can take 60 times of his original uh, investment and uh, exit the company. Nice. <clears throat> Anything else which anybody would like to add or ask? So I think. Uh, Dr. Rao, I think we should add something. So I think we've all had a good discussion and a very uh, good in view of uh, all the premium institutes as well as practices, group practice, the finance behind it. And uh, each seems doing a wonderful job. But I think, as everybody said, it's the work, the compassion, and uh, the effort to keep the whole team together and motivated to do the good work. I think that... I think is the bottom line to your success. So thank you very much, everybody, for uh, this wonderful meeting. Thank you. Just thank one, you. just one sentence. Yes, sir. <laughs> Whatever we do, in whichever way we do, let's not, as educated citizens of India, forget the bottom twenty-five percent of our country. Yeah, absolutely. It's yeah. eight thirty. Uh, they go to bed hungry every single day. Remember that. And we are, we are enjoying their share of the wealth also from the national perspective. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you, doctor.
this has been a wonderful session we had over 100 attendees for this session i hope you have enjoyed uh, we will now conclude this hall thank you thank you thank you, thank you. bye everyone stay safe bye 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 bye, bye.